Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast and iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We're coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, wherever you find your podcast. Our guests today are Hans and Jennifer Apple. They're here to talk to us about award-winning culture. Hey, before our guest comes in, you know, we gave a sneak preview of the Solve for Kids podcast here on Reading With Your Kids, and it was so popular, it's like spun off. It spun off into its own thing. And I, my, my, my buddy, our, our dean of all things STEM and STEAM, Jennifer Swanson, is here to tell us a little bit about what's going on with this great new podcast. Hey, Jennifer, what's up? Hi, Jed. Oh, I am so excited about our new podcast. We've been getting some great reviews. Everybody wants to find out what's going on and meet and listen to some of our scientists and engineers. We have done how do you map an underwater forest? Yeah. We have done how do you cut a person in half safely? Safely. Of course. Yep. Mm-hmm. We have talked about be, uh, improving your connection with water by going on a water walk, and we have watched Vanessa Brantley Newton create illustrations that come to life. I took a water walk with my amazing niece. We had such a great time. I didn't fall into the water, but we had re- it was really, really fun. And I love all the I love the fact that all of our guests are giving our wonderful listeners challenges, really fun challenges that they can do together as a family. And that's so cool. Hey, tell everybody where they can find Solve for Kids because it's not on the Reading with Your Kids podcast. It's its own thing. So please, if you want to keep listening, go over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and subscribe. And down, you can download all four of the first episodes that we have, plus listen to all the new ones we have coming out. You can also find on Stitcher Radio and, of course, through our website, SolveItForKids.com. Jennifer, thanks so much. Thanks for helping letting me be part of this awesome, awesome, awesome podcast. Well, we make a great STEM team, don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, join us over at SolveItForKids.com. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Washington. This is a husband and wife team I'm really excited about. Please welcome to the show the authors of Award-Winning Culture and also the authors of Award-Winning Dog, Hans and Jennifer Apple. Hans and Jennifer, welcome. How are you? Hey, we're excited to be here. How are you doing today? Thanks for having us. You are welcome. You are welcome. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm I was just speaking to to Hans and Jennifer. Um, I love what they're doing. Award winning culture is uh, is something that that's exciting me. Uh, they're they're two different books and they're created for two different audiences, but they have the same goal. So Hans, why don't you start by um, letting us know what award winning culture is all about? Yeah, well, Jed. First off, thanks for having us on the show. We I guess believe that education at its highest level is about inspiring others to discover and develop their joy. And when you think about that, that's kind of everything. You know, your joy is your purpose, your meaning. Um, So our whole mission with what we're doing um, for schools and districts around the country is trying to help educators bring back the joy into their classrooms, into their school. And we think that that all really begins with um, creating exceptional school culture. Um, so I wrote a book recently uh, called Award-Winning Culture, and it's kind of um, centered around three big pillars. So it's character, excellence, and community. So character being will you do the right thing, excellence being will you do your very best, and community being what will you do for others today. We think these three pillars are um, kind of the, the key to – you know, creating the communities and, and you know, the, the environments that we want to see in our country today. I, I love that. And I, 
it, it, as I was saying to you earlier, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. This is a message that is similar to the one that I've been sharing with kids through my educational magic shows for over 30 years. The the idea that uh, you know you wake up every morning and and make a choice to to do the right thing, to treat people with respect, to treat yourself with respect, and go and do your best, and to just come together as a community. Now you. Unlike me, who's a, an outsider, who's looking at things and, and going into various schools, you're actually in the thick of it, Hans. You are working in schools every day. Is that right? We are. We're both, uh, Jennifer and I are middle school educators. So I'm a counselor. She's a teacher. We both work at the same school. So that's pretty amazing to be husband and wife, uh, uh-huh. you know, have an opportunity to impact kids every single day. Um, but our, our heart is really with that middle school age, uh, kids. Uh, we love them. They, they, they have so much craziness going on. Um, and, uh, we, we think that it's, it's pivotal to, um, you know, reach them at a, at a young age. So we're, we're very blessed to be able to impact kids on a daily basis. Now it's, it's interesting, Jennifer, that you, you both love that middle school kid that that age that's a tough age that is not that is not an e- easy age to go through or or was my experience just completely different than what you're seeing no I, I think it is a tough time and and I think it's funny because um when I, I'm actually a trained elementary teacher I said I would never teach over second grade like <laughs> oof, the older kids scared me um so I wanted to be like a k2 teacher I love the little ones and so when I got a job as a seventh grade math teacher, my first year teaching, I, I wasn't sure what to do. Um, and once I was with those kids, I just love them. I, I think it takes a certain person to be a middle school teacher, but those of us that are in middle school, we love it. Like we really do love those kids. And, and every group of students has their own struggles they're dealing with. It's just middle school is, um, your body physically is going through things. Mm-hmm. You're mentally going through things, and then plus you're going to school. And so it's just this time in your life that you have a lot of different obstacles going on. And now we have, you know, phones and social media. So they have a lot of factors in their life. But I really do love the age, and I'm really glad that I got a job in middle school um, because I wouldn't have known how much I enjoyed working with those kids. So, so but by by what you just said, it sounds like it wasn't like a choice that okay, I'm going to try this middle school thing. Now it's more. It sounds more like oh, I got to do this. Yeah, well, it it kind of was. Um, I actually applied for a bunch of second grade jobs. That's what I wanted to teach. It was my goal to be a second grade teacher. Um, and they, I was told by a few different people, I was way too energetic. They did not <laughs> like my. I was. I had way too much personality. I was way too energetic. And so um, I was kind of having trouble finding an elementary job, and I happened to move in next door to the principal of the middle school, and she's like, do you need a job? <laughs> and I said, sure. And so I went and interviewed, and, you know, I, I loved math, and so that's what I was going to teach, and I thought, okay, you know, I'll try this. This is fun. And, you know, after like two days, I was hooked. I loved it. So it kind of fell into my lap, but, you know, everything in life happens for a reason, and there was a reason that I moved in next to the middle school principal and I got a job in middle school because I was destined to be there. I can't imagine anybody saying, oh, you were too energetic to teach second graders. <laughs> I, 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 my, my mind is boggled here. Um, Hans, as a, as, a, as a counselor in a middle school, just tell us, that's, that, that must be a, a real challenge because kids are coming to you and then they're not coming to you to, to figure out what college they, they want to go to. They're coming to you with some really, you know, uh, in their minds, uh, very, very serious issues, I imagine. Absolutely. And, and I feel like, you know, we've both, Jennifer and I, have been in education for uh, about 20 years now. And I feel like even though kids are kids, I I do feel like it's changed over the course of 20 years. You know, I'm seeing, and I think Jen would agree, I, so much more anxiety mm-hmm. than we ever used to. And it, it's, it's just kind of amazing. I, I read recently research that says the average uh, kid today has as much anxiety as the average psychiatric patient of the 1950s. Oh. 
In other words, kids that are just walking around today are dealing with so much more than you and I did when we were kids, Jed. So it's, you know, I, I feel like that's really become a huge part of my job is helping, you know, make kids feel welcome and safe and comfortable so that they can actually go into Jen's class and all the other great teachers and learn, mm-hmm. right? So I, I think that's been a big focus for us with building award-winning culture is we, we really wanted to get back to, you know, let's l- allow kids to be kids. You know, it felt like um, kids were coming to school with so many other problems and struggles and, um, you know, it was almost impossible for them to learn. Mm-hmm. I, I love that let kids be kids idea. That that is something early on in my um in in my career performing I, I had this one experience and, and I was at a middle school and the principal came down and this was in a tough inner city school and he just he introduced me by saying I don't know whose idea it was to bring this person in here, but it's only going to be 45 <laughs> minutes, so just be quiet and sit through it. <laughs> and, wow. And I was, I mean, I was steaming, and I was determined that these kids were going to love me. And they, and they did. And the thing that, that opened up this, this principal's eyes was that, you know, he was looking at me coming in and doing magic tricks for these tough inner city kids who were already at seventh and eighth grade with dealing with things like drugs and violence. And he didn't think that they could relate to someone doing tricks and, and having fun. But, but the magic of that show was that I took those kids who were dealing with those real world adult issues and I let them be kids. You know, suddenly there were these tough eighth graders who were giggling and laughing and, and being goofy on stage with me. And I think that that's so important. We've, we, we seem so determined to have our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders be adults way too soon. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'll, I'll make a personal connection with you here, Jed. I actually uh, put my way through college working as a close-up magician. Ah. So I totally relate to what you're saying about the connection that we can make with folks that, um, you know, just by doing a simple trick, right, just just by doing a card trick and just allowing people to connect with us on a, on a deeper personal way. Yeah, yeah. So what's the first step? You know, what, on your website, one of the first things I see is you ask the question, does your school culture have the power to evoke tears of joy? What's one of the first things a school needs to do to create that kind of culture? So I would say it really starts by um, putting together a group of teachers and educators um, that are committed to reaching the whole child. And I think that begins with finding um, a character education, social-emotional learning curriculum that you can do on a school-wide basis. And then taking that and really – you know, expanding outside of just the classroom. So moving that to where um, parents are on the same page at home, you're all speaking a common language, office staff, principal, you know, bus driver are all kind of engaged in, you know, the same lens of how we see school culture. And I, th- I think the other piece as a um, teacher who actually taught um, in this kind of culture is that experiential piece for students. Um, I can explain to them what it means to have good character. I can explain to them what it means to serve others. But unless they actually do it, they're not really going to truly understand what that means. Mm-hmm. So by my my doing experiential projects with my students and them actually experiencing giving to others and experiencing um, serving others, then they really understand that concept on a much deeper level than just talking at them or showing them a video or experiencing it through someone else. They need to experience that themselves in order for them to really grasp it and learn that concept. Now, Jennifer, what what would you say to somebody who's listening to this and thinking to themselves, you're, you're a math teacher. What does serving others 
have to do with math? How can we raise, you know, our kids in the United States, they're not performing on, on the same level as kids in different countries, especially in things like math. Uh, why are you wasting time serving? Well, how does that help kids become proficient in math? Yeah, and, and I think that um, what Hans touched on earlier was the anxiety piece, right? And so kids come to us with this severe kind of anxiety. And as anxiety goes up, empathy goes down, right? And so having these students, they, they're not able to learn if they're in such a place of high anxiety. So even if, I mean, I could get through the curriculum in a day, they're not going to retain any of that information because they have such high anxiety. So I'm trying to do things um, by having them serve others that empathy is going up, which means anxiety is going down, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I'm bringing them to that state where they are understanding, they're having empathy, they're um, showing those character traits, they are able to actually retain more information. So it actually really does help them because I'm not actually able to teach them anything when they're in, you know, when you're in a state of anxiety, you don't hear anything. You don't know anything that's going on around you. So it's the same in a classroom. So you have to get those students. That's why we teach this service model, this character excellence community. It really brings the students to a power, an empowerment point where they feel like they're empowered to learn. They're in a state they can learn. Um, and so they actually retain much more information. The first year I did this, I didn't change anything of my curriculum, my, my core curriculum. I was a language arts teacher at the time. I didn't change anything in my language arts curriculum. The only thing I changed was teaching students this character excellence community. My test scores went up 10 percentage points. I did nothing else different. All I did was teach these kids character. And so this proves that obviously I'm teaching the same content. I'm doing everything the same, but I'm now putting in this extra piece of teaching them empathy, teaching them service. They excelled academically because they had the confidence and they were empowered to do that now. Wow. What a, what a crazy concept, Hans. Uh, figure out a, figuring out a way that, that, that helps kids be prepared to learn instead of just having them sit in rows and try to bang things into their head. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Jed, you know, the reality is, if we only focus on the academics, we're only giving students 30 to 50% of what they need to be successful after high school. Mm -hmm. It really is all of these soft skills that we're talking about. It's these social, you know, emotional skills, these interpersonal skills, the, the ability to regulate your emotions and, and have grit and, and show empathy and kindness. That ultimately leads to success down the road, right? In college and work life and home and family and church, whatever. Um, that's what's critical. And so if we only are focusing on academics, then we're really not doing our, our best job for our students. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I have interviewed literally dozens and dozens of, of leaders of industry um, through various podcasts, and each and every one of them tell me the same thing. We can teach them the skills. We can teach them how to do the job here, but we can't teach them how to get along with others. If, if they don't know how to work together as a team, there's nothing. It doesn't matter what degree they have. There's nothing that they can do here. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and they say that you know the the next generation, most of their jobs, they're gonna have like you know five different careers over their lifetime, mm -hmm. and there or more. Yeah. I mean that that's a guesstimate. <laughs> and there a lot of them are gonna be independent. Like they're gonna be running their own businesses. It's the world's gonna kind of look different in the next you know 50 years. And so they're going to have jobs where they have to adapt to a whole new situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been a teacher for 21 years, and I will keep being a teacher for quite a bit longer. I mean, I'm going to have basically one career for most of my adult life. Right. And for the next generation, that's not going to happen. They have to adjust and adapt to new situations at all times, which is what this is all about. Yeah. I'm going to throw this out for both of you. You both mentioned a couple of times your know, kids coming in with all this stress and much more stress than I experienced and that, that you folks experienced. What is it that's causing kids to, to have this incredible level of stress? Oh, man, I feel like it's so many things, Jed. Um, you know, I, I think 
Jen kind of alluded to the social media part. I think that's a comparison game. Am I as cool as the person that I'm seeing on Instagram? Um, that's really hard. I think, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty in the world. You know, when I started um, the very beginning of my career, no one worried about school shootings. No one worried about that even being on anybody's radar. And, you know, that was right at the beginning uh, of when we started in education. And that kind of flipped everybody to where, okay, now we really do need to pay attention to these ideas of harassment and bullying. And, and I know you and I were talking beforehand how, you know, when you, when you were getting into uh, some of the performing and things in schools, that was a big focal point, right, for a, for a period of time. And then you guys kind of realized, hey, really the thing here is, these students need to, to learn character ed. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we're seeing too. We're seeing kids that, like one of the things that we do is we'll greet students every day as they come into our school. Mm -hmm. Like we just start every single day. We call it our Wildcat Nation morning greeting. And so we're out there at the front of the school with student leaders and educators every day. It doesn't matter what the weather is. It could be rain, sun, snow, whatever. We're out there every single day. We've done that for years, and we're literally connecting with every single person that walks in the door, right? Like a smile, a compliment, a fist bump. We play music. It really is the place to be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we know we can actually watch students come up with their hood on, head down. They look like they've just been, you know, through a war zone at home dealing with whatever's going on um, that they're struggling with. And they come in and we're able to just instantly lift their spirits, right? And you can watch their head pop up. You can watch the hood come off, the smile come out, and now they're ready to be learners. And so I think there's a multitude of reasons why students come to us that way. I'm sure poverty plays a role. I'm sure social media plays a role. I know mental health is a factor. There's a number of different things. But, um, you know, as educators, we're in a position where, we can impact those kids on a daily basis and really set them up for a life of hope. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I have to tell you, I, I, there was so many times that, that I was in schools and, and there was one time that stood out in particular. My wife was uh, teaching in Boston and she had a principal that wasn't very engaged with the kids and it was frustrating for my wife, uh, uh, you know, and as I went in to help her, it was frustrating for me. I, and and uh, right around that time, I was at a, uh, performing at a school in Pittsburgh. And the principal at that school, there were five or 600 kids at the school. She knew every single kid by name and, mm -hmm. and greeted them and, and shook their hand or gave them a hug or whatever. And I was like, oh, my goodness. My wife's school would be so much different if the principal only knew the teachers' names. Never mind, never mind every kid. Um, I think that's so important to to make that connection, uh, so that it, you know uh, th that you're not only connected with your with your teacher in your classroom, but you feel connected with the guidance counselor, with the principal, the assistant principal, with the other teachers in the school. Yeah, and, and, um, I was a college professor for about 10 years and I was teaching future teachers. And one of the things I would always tell them is that the top five motivators, one of them is your name. Mm. So one of the things that it's, it's above food, which is crazy. <laughs> you know, when you think about for kids, <laughs> like one of the top five motivators and above it is your name. Like just saying the child's name is one of the top motivators for students. So when you're talking to them, saying their name, and if your principal knows your name and the counselor knows your name and you go to the um, cafeteria to get your lunch and the gal that checks you out, she knows your name. And then you go to get on the bus and the bus driver knows your name and, and everybody knows who you are and you also know their name. Mm -hmm. That's the important part I try to tell my students is it's not just people should know you. You should also know them. Yes. So you should acknowledge the custodian by his name. Mm -hmm. You know, tell him thank you. You should acknowledge the gal in the lunchroom that's helping you get your food, right? And you should say thank you to them. And acknowledging each other by their name and treating them as if they're human, yeah, right? Absolutely. It's not just somebody that's working here to clean up after me or do whatever. I, You're a human. I appreciate you for who you are. Absolutely. 
Now we've talked a lot. Uh, we talked a lot about a lot of things here, and I know we 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 directly mentioned that award-winning culture is uh, a a great book for educators, and and I would even say it's a great book for parents um, to you know kind of read and then maybe bring to your principal, the principal of your kid's school. <laughs> um, just get that little dig. Hey, why don't you check this out? Uh, but award-winning dogs is, is a little bit different. That's focused on kids. So why don't we, uh, Jennifer, just quickly uh, talk about that book. Yeah, so it's um, I basically based it off the three pillars that Hans talks about in his book, Character, Excellent Community. And um, the dog in the book is actually our own dog, Maya. Um, it's loosely based on her life. Um, and she basically goes through um, – this adventure to discover um, her own joy and how she can bring joy to others. Um, and so she takes this adventure and she um, talks to her three special friends, her the rabbit, the squirrel, and the duck, and they help her through um, discovering basically how she's really an award-winning dog. Um, and you can be award-winning you don't have to be the prettiest. You don't have to be the fastest. You don't have to be all these things to be the best, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can be a great person based on who you are and your personality and how you treat other people. So that's kind of what the book is. Well, I love it for, for uh, you, you know, I, I, my, my high school, I, I went to a Jesuit high school and our whole thing was to, to be, it was an all boys school. So we're all about being men for others. And right. I know that that made a, a, a huge difference in, in the way I looked at life and, and, and approached school. And, and I love what you folks are doing. Where can, where can parents, educators go to learn more about award-winning book and award-winning dog? Yeah, you can go. Our website is very simple. It's awardwinningculture.com. So you can go to the website and you can um, – my book will um, – We'll be on there, and Hans's book is on there, um, and you can just find out more information. We speak at schools. We do coaching. Um, there's lots of different resources on there for people to kind of look at and, and find out um, information for others or for themselves. Well, we've had a great time speaking to Hans and Jennifer Apple about award-winning culture. Uh, Jennifer, Hans, thanks so much for being part of our show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We've had a blast. Thanks for having us. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Darren Garwood. He is the author of Jackson Superhero. Now, this is talk about a, a powerful and a beautiful and a really touching story. You don't want to miss this. Uh, Darren, Darren created Jackson Superhero for his son to help his son experience life. I, I, I can't explain it any more than that. You don't want to miss this show. It's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. If you're the author of a fantastic children's book, you may be frustrated right now because all of the traditional ways of promoting your book are, are not available to you right now. School visits, not happening anytime in the near future. Uh, book signings, Guess maybe there might be some outside, but I mean, how many people are going to want to go to a book signing, stand in line, you know, um, library visits, not happening. It's tough. It's tough to market a book anyways. It's especially tough right now. Well, we have something that may help. It's called the Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Program. We have a team, and if our team believes that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a certified great read. And with that status comes a whole lot of tools that can really help your book stand out from the crowd of books that are, that are published every single month. Check it out today. Go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Author Services button at the top of the page. You will learn all about the program. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guests, Hans and Jennifer Apple. Please be sure to check out Award Winning Culture. I also want to thank my incredible team, starting with my amazing producer, Fatima Khan. I want to thank my awesome author, Ambassador Peggy Cotto. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support that she's been giving me, being my best friend, being my pandemic quarantine buddy. I also want to thank my buddy, Augie the Doggy, for having my back here in the studio. But most of all, 
I want to thank you. You've been your kids' pandemic buddy. They're locked down, buddy. They're locked down, teachers. And you always, always, always take the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.